You're going to get the go. We're going to go through today yet another multi-dimensional array. I'm sure most of you have seen uh, these over the years. So we just had Marshall essay. Did you actually get it right this time? So we're going to let him be, give an opinion on. I didn't say that. What I said was the other ones I've seen were wrong. Ah, okay. By implication. Yeah. But I didn't want to put you on the spot. Something's off with the projector because it's Okay. Not so while you're figuring that out, I'll just keep going. I don't need your slides. I'm plugged into the VGA. Okay, so I've got a question for multidimensional array. This is a question I've been asking colleagues for, for several years now. So we've got, so I started off 30 years ago, just to give it, and working doing scientific and engineering programming in Fortran. So this was, I was one of the early adopters of this newfangled thing called C, and then one of the early adopters of this newfangled thing 20 years ago of C++. So one of the questions that, uh, that has come up over the years is what is the proper way to lay out a multidimensional array? And this has come up as, as these, I've been in the, one of the early adopters. So I just want a quick show of hands. So for those who are familiar with row major versus column major, you can generalize this to whether you index from left to right or right to left. So is the Fortran style the proper way to do a multidimensional array indexing? Yes. Yes. And no. yes. There's an, oh, uh oh, somebody looked ahead. Okay. No style is right. <laughs> okay. I will, so I will make the argument that it sometimes depends on your kernel. Okay. No, no style is right because sometimes you don't want to transpose in an expensive yeah. manner. Okay. So what is the right way? The right way is to store uh, extents in, an, in a fixed size. Okay. <laughs> so the the ant usually I'll get in my my engineering colleagues crowd is that well, that. C, C just completely messed it up the Fortran is the right way, and I get a whole bunch of hands that way. And then I ask the other people who are early adopters, and I, I, I tell them, okay, you're both wrong. And then I have someone raise their hand and say, ah, oh, you should be tiling it because that's the best way to get cache performance. Say, well, you're getting close now. The best way to lay out a multidimensional array we found over the years is whatever gives you the best performance. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is the answer. Now the question, how can you do that without having to rewrite your code for every time you finally get it to a new architecture because best performance is architecture dependent. And so we end up with people who will rewrite and rewrite and rewrite as cache sizes change. They'll go through all these auto-tuning processes and it's just obscene. So there's one issue right there, is the how to properly lay out and properly abstract your arrays such that you don't have to worry about that anymore and don't have to keep rewriting code over and over as architectures evolve and change. Did you see my slide deck already? No. Okay. <laughs> you must have, or you read the paper. Okay. No, I implemented something like this. Very, very good. Okay. So we started a little bit earlier than that, but anyway. Um, then the other thing that came up, and this was in a, about 20 years ago, it was in a, um, a little over 20 years ago. So in a uh, class on parallel pro high performance computing, parallel programming, and professor comes in the door just laughing because someone had tried running some linear algebra kernels written in C++, the early adopter I said, and he was laughing because we'd had that discussion before, laughing and said that the performance on the Cray was just totally abysmal, but they had set a new record for gigafunction calls per second because the, they had overloaded the array indexing operator and it didn't get in line and it, the performance was just abysmal. <laughs> so, so he was laughing and I was saying, okay, yes, Fortran, because it's native in the language, will do the compiler can do the right thing. And you have to be awfully darn careful with your implementation to get it done right in the library. So this becomes part of the awfully darn careful in your library implementation. Now that we have done this in several different libraries and several people have done this over the years in several different libraries, what we'd like to have is that if we can get doing it right in a standard library, then the compilers only have to recognize one pattern instead of hopefully guiding it along many patterns to get there. So Bryce and I started uh, discussing this a while back. Bryce has been on the, the journey of, of learning the design decisions and he is so he, it's all fresh in his mind so he's going to go through step by step this, this design, ment this mental design process journey that he's gone on in the last few months 
on how this all works. So it's, it's very fresh in his mind, so it's a lot better for him to present it since it's old hat to me. And then I'll come up, then I'll finish up uh, back cleanup on where things could go and a little bit about the library we have that implements mo uh, pretty much all of this, but not in the way the, the standard we're proposing for the standard. So. So this is this is Carter uh, from Sandia. I'm Bryce. Uh, I work at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And let me get hooked up here. I'm in the computer architecture group there, uh, which is mostly hardware people, and then there's a couple uh, software guys there. And uh, we do a lot of uh, a lot of different work, but one of the primary things I do is I sort of like go in. Uh, to like a particular application and like help them fix performance issues and like identify why their code is not performing well. Uh, so I end up looking at a whole bunch of different uh, code bases, many of which are just, like one you know PhD student's written it and it's become an important code base for some reason. Uh, and so we have we have about 300 uh, code bases at our at our lab. Uh, so so 300 applications. Most of them are like small small applications. And for us, it's very important to have uh, good frameworks so that we're not uh, reproducing our efforts and optimizing codes. So what we're going to talk about today is something called ArrayRef, which is a proposed multidimensional array reference type for the C++ standard library, which is configurable through customization points. So I, I always start off my talks by explaining why I'm talking about what I'm talking about. So I'm going to try to convince you that we, we need to have uh, ArrayRef, that it's an important thing to have. So multidimensional arrays are a foundational data structure for a number of domains. It's, it's a vocabulary type if you're doing numerical programming. So it, it's important for graphics, gaming, and for, for us, for people who are doing scientific computing, it's, it's a really big deal. All of our applications uh, are using multidimensional arrays for the most part. So there's a bunch of different libraries out there that implement multidimensional arrays in C++. So there's Blitz++, there's Eigen, Boost Multi-Array, NT2, Cocos, which is uh, the project that Carter works on. There's a whole bunch more. Uh, in fact, this is one of the, the issues. So this is all of the multidimensional arrays that I've had to, to deal with in the past uh, three months. And the fact that there are two things with the same name here is not a typo. I have two different code bases that happen to have the, some, a, a very similar implementation of a multidimensional array, but they, they've got two distinct implementations. And uh, it's a real pain because I, I have to deal with all of these, and I have to go through and like, apply the same set of fixes to all of these. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on one in particular. So one of my colleagues, Paul, uh, has a climate code where he's, he's got this thing called data array 4D. And I'm going through his code and trying to figure out why it's slow. And I'm like, oh, Paul, you should, stop, you should stop doing these divides here. And then his code got much faster. And then I'm like looking at his array and I'm like, Paul, wh why, are you, why are you doing arrays of arrays of arrays? So he's, he's not doing like a contiguous array, but he had like an array of uh, pointers to arrays. And then like he would just like allocate the underlying arrays. And he was like, well, I don't like having like the call operator syntax for indexing. So because of that, I, I really want to have the bracket syntax. So that's why I'm doing that. So then I had to explain to him why this was a bad idea. Uh, and then he's like, well, I really don't want to make that code change. So like, can you go and like, like come up with some solution for me for that? So, so just like the stuff like this, I have to deal with all the time. And it's a real pain that we don't have some standard vocabulary type that we can use that I can just like tip point people at and be like, use this thing. Use this as your abstraction. And it's, I, I like to say that like array types are like the string types of numerical programming. Every sufficiently large numerical project has like four or five or six of them. So I, I believe that standardizing uh, array ref or standardizing this type of facility will improve interoperability between libraries and with other languages and portability and code re reuse too. There's another motivating factor for me, which is that uh, the idea that you just sort of have this pile of main memory and that like it's all just the same and you, like just you allocate it and you use it, that's not true on modern hardware. So we're increasingly moving towards a world where you're going to have different types of hardware you may have different memory spaces, like you might have memory on your GPUs, on your accelerators. You might have high bandwidth memory. 
of some, some type that's on package and you're going to need some sort of abstraction that knows how to like access those different types of memory and access those different memory spaces. Carter is going to talk, talk more about that uh, during his portion. And there's also different access mechanisms uh, that you might have, even for main memory. The, the best example of this is uh, cache bypass stores on Intel x86. Uh, which is also known as non-temporal or streaming stores, where you basically you're, you're, it's a it's a hint uh, to tell your compiler and, and to then tell the processor that hey I I'm I'm writing this thing and I'm not going to use it anytime soon. Don't don't like write it to the cache and then write it to main memory. Just like write it to main memory. So so. One of the questions I, I've gotten about ArrayRef is like, do we really need this thing? Like, like, do, don't we have things in the standard that that like we can use for this? Like, what about like Valarray or like, don't we have multi-dimensional arrays in C? So let's let's go through and, and uh, look at whether or not we have things that that work as as good array abstractions and good sort of general purpose array abstractions. So let's start off here. So this is all pretty straightforward. And I think non-controversial. So, like, this is how you declare like a C-style, one-dimensional, statically sized array. And this is the C++ equivalent. So you just use array. This is pretty pretty basic. So this is this is for a one-dimensional, dynamically sized array. Now, if I was really doing it C-style, I would have a malloc here. But like the malloc and then the cast doesn't really all fit on the slide. So we'll, we'll sort of cheat and use new. So this is all pretty pretty easy. All right, so then we have this. So C has support for, for not really multidimensional arrays, but you have this thing that kind of looks like a multidimensional array, and the way that it's specified, it kind of doesn't have any performance issues or any semantic issues that would make you think that it's not a proper multidimensional array. So this, this one kind of works fine as long as you know at compile time what the size of the array is going to be. But is there like a C++ equivalent of this? Is there some standard library type that we can use here? Does anybody have any suggestions for what we could, we could use? Array, array. Uh, we'll, we'll get there. So like this is what I would want, right? Would be like this, but this doesn't exist. So like you have this. Um, so let's talk about why this is bad. So, so who has an opinion about why this is bad? Yes. That is, that is correct. I don't want to write the order of, of, of my dimensions backwards. I'm writing MN instead of NM. Anybody else have any issues with anything with, with the, the way I'm doing this? I don't like writing array twice. That's my second issue here. And like if I'm doing a 4D array, I don't like writing array four times. That's not, that's not fun. But for now, we're going to pretend that this is, this is good enough. Um, it's not, but we're going to just, just pretend that this, is, this works for now. All right, what about for, for a dynamic... Uh, C style multidimensional array. Does this work? No, this, 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 this does not work. So we can't do this. You can't, you can't uh, make a call new like this and there's no, there's no like multidimensional malloc in C. So there's, there's no way to sort of express this. So, oops, that slide should have been a little later. Just ignore that one for now. All right, so yeah, yeah. So the, you have the, like you don't have a multidimensional vector either. So like this doesn't work. Let's try something else. So like, what about, what about this? Does, does anybody like this? So we've got uh, a T star star, then we're going to do, we're going to allocate an array of pointers, then we're going to have this for loop, we're going to go and allocate a bunch of columns. Is, is, is this good? So good. Does, this works, right? Like, this compiles. <laughs> All right, so for anybody who might not know why this is bad, let's, let's go into that. So, so here's like the, the vector equivalent of this, where you've got like a vector of a vector. It does basically the same thing. All right, so let's look at what element access looks like for all of these different methods here. So for the 1D arrays, it's pretty simple, right? You've got like this, and it basically reduces down to like, you've got some pointer arithmetic and then one at memory access, right? You've got 1D reference here. Nice, simple, easy. All right, this, this sort of reduces into something nice as well. So it ends up being just some, some integer arithmetic and then some pointer arithmetic and then one memory access. So this pattern here, uh, this ends up giving you two indirections because it's, it's not a contiguous block of memory. It's, it's an array of arrays. So this is bad, but a lot of programmers who, who are maybe not familiar with, with this end up writing this the first time. I see this pretty frequently. I would have expected to see people write vector of vector. Uh, so so that, that's actually the one that I see more frequently is vector of vector. Um, Ten years ago. 
Okay. Yeah, okay. Ten, 10 years ago, you see this one more. Vector to vector comes up a good vector bit, yeah. Vector is conceptually the same as this. Yes, yes. And, and the memory layout is almost identical as well. Yes, it is, yeah. Um, <laughs> hang on, so, so okay, so same, same story for here. All right, so you're suggesting that we do this, right? And, and then maybe have some macro for access, for, for indexing? Okay, so this, this is better, now we've got a contiguous region. That. Yeah. Yes, that is, that is what people do. Um, so that, that's the fast way of doing things. When, once they've learned how bad Yeah, is. but yeah. I have issues with that too, so. When you're doing that, so, so you're, what we've done is we've flattened the array, we've done one big allocation. The difference is that so we've lost some, some, uh, something in the syntax here. So now you've got to like, you, your indexing logic is exposed to the user. This is, this is not good. It's not just ugly, but it, it has one other big problem, which is that it, it means that the, the user has to know what array layout you're working with. So same thing here. Let's, let's say that this is better. I, I'm, I'm going to argue that this is worse than this. That may or may not be true, but I think this is the better analog for a uh, static multidimensional array, because I think this is just awful. On the other hand, that, will get, that, sh that should get you a contiguous block of memory. Uh, both of these should get you a contiguous block of memory. Yeah. The, the problem is that the, when the dimensionality isn't carried with the type, um, it's really error prone. That was the point. Yes. That, there's that too, yes. Um, <laughs> All right, so you could, you could easily get rid of the, uh, the, 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 the remark was that, was that when, the, when the dimensionality is not carried with the type, it's very error prone. And sorry. The you can easily get away from the array repeats with like a simple variadic type depth. Uh, y you, you could. Um, we're getting there. We're getting there. I, we're, we're getting there. I don't, I don't think that's the right abstraction. I mean, it's, it's yeah, yeah. You, you know, arguably you could get there, yeah. Um, I think the, the remark about not having the dimensionality carried with the type is more error prone is a very good one. All right, so let's talk about array layouts. So my definition, or, or the, the, the sort of formal definition of array layout is that array layout is a mapping from an index or, or a domain to linear storage or a range. So, so it's, it's just a function that's mapping from, from a uh, set of inputs to a set of outputs. So you can also sort of think of it more informally as a method for arranging a multidimensional array in memory. So there's a whole bunch of different layouts. Uh, there's two primary ones. This is, this is like the most error prone two or three slides in the talk. So try to find whatever bugs are here. <laughs> uh, so, so there's row major, which is also known as sort of a left layout. And that's the default in C++ and in NumPy, which is Python's numeric library package. And so the way that I remember this is that the last dimension is contiguous in row major. So it, column major which, or right is the Fortran or MATLAB way of doing things and the way I remember that is that the first dimension is contiguous. It's so like we've got this, this two by two matrix here, uh, A11, A12, yada yada. So for, for, for row major, we're going to be, so the last dimension is contiguous, so the last dimension here is, is columns, so like the J is, 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 is this direction, so this is going to be right here, then this is going to be right here. And then for, for Fortran, uh, no, this is uh, this is this is correct. It's correct on your slide, but it's not correct the way you said it. Uh, and <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, <laughs> yes, yes, you are correct. I meant to do this and this and this and this. Can I make a suggestion? For yeah. Future versions of the slide. Yeah. Two by three instead of two by two. Yeah. Yeah. Two by two. When I, I when I did two by three, it gets to be too long. Eh, I maybe could have fit it. You can skip like. Four, five, and six out of your list there. Yes. This, I know the slide is correct because I checked it a few times. My words out of my mouth may be wrong. I'm, I'm just saying yeah. I think it would be clear. If yes. All right. So, but, so everybody's pretty clear on what's going on here, even if I'm not. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, so again, the, the way that I always remember this is, is I look at what's the, the dimension that's contiguous. So in, in row major, it's the last dimension is, is contiguous. In column major, the first dimension is, is contiguous. Yeah. It, it, so the question was, well, are there performance implications to whether, it's, whether you're doing row major or column major? The answer is yes. There's all sorts of performance implications. It depends on, on your kernel. It's, it, the, yeah. I'm not talking about kernel. 
I'm talking about fundamental. It depends on the access patterns you're using for the array. And the architecture. And the architecture. So what do what Fortran people do when they don't want column major? They change the way they write their code to make sure column that they access it column major. Yeah. So then in that case, though, there's really nothing fundamental about row major or column major. Um, The question was, is there anything fundamentally different about row major or column major, or is it, is it, is that it's not the Fundamentally, that's why it is quite. Yeah, Patrick, what's, what's? So this is only like about memory layout, right? So the actual indexing is something a bit uh, separate as well, right? Like if you index by two indices, uh, the row would usually go first, right? No matter which memory layout you have. Kind of two different things, right? uh, the question was, is indexing divorced from layout? Um, I'm not sure that I... The expressions. You've got different expressions that show up in your code. Uh, yes. If, if yeah. Only if you allocate like, your, your, your uh, array that way, right? If you did the old multi-dimensional array, you would just go bracket I. Yeah, but, but under the hood, the, the C-style multi-dimensional array, it, it, it's, it's going to reduce down to... Uh, to being this, if you if you read the way that it's but spec'd, it again it's a notational. Thing. It's yeah, a yes. Notation that the user sees is I J. Yes. Right? Which is exactly the subscripting that you're showing in your. Yes. What do you think about this? Is this that uh, having done programming in both Fortran and C plus plus and written optimizations for this, um, is that you have a choice, right? You can pick the, the column or row major of your matrix, right, of your array, and you can pick how you write the code, what it is. Yeah. If you fix the code, then the choice of row or column major has a major impact on performance. If you fix the array format and can change your code to match the array format, then um, how you write your code has a major impact on performance. Um, but fundamentally, how you index your data structures and the dimensionality is baked into the code. You can transpose everything or not, but otherwise... Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to repeat that one because it was... It, yeah. All right, David. So I'm probably getting ahead, but the reason I'm bringing this up is I don't want to flag in the standard library that's returning on Fortran kernel support. That's we can stick with just one of these. That would uh, be fine. Uh, no, you you can't. Let's move, well, let's, let's, let's move on. Um, this slide, more general form of these algorithms, these are probably correct. Uh, no, 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 I'm pretty sure they are. I checked this slide a few times. Um, just the, the only important thing here, just this is what it looks like when you sort of uh, uh, expand out the formula down to 3D. Just, just for anybody who's not familiar with what, what this all looks like. So there's other layouts that you might care about. So these layouts have the property that, uh, that they are uh, injective um, and regular. So they're injective. Every element in the domain maps to one element in the range. Uh, so every element in the, the input set maps to one element in the contiguous storage. And also they're regular, so the distance between elements uh, when one of the indices uh, of the multi-index is in incremented state is constant. Uh, so there's other compl more complex layouts. There are injective and regular layouts uh, where like you have different orderings that aren't these. Like you might have like an IKJ ordering or let, we're instead of like an IJK or a KJI uh, ordering, which is what row, row major and column major correspond to. Um, and there are some cases where, where that's actually a thing you want to do. Um, yeah. A comment to, to, to what I said earlier. So MATLAB is, for example, like on the, on the right side. Yeah. Um, but when you actually access an array with I and J in MATLAB, the row would still go first. Uh, yeah, we're, we're going we're, we're, we're gonna to get to that. We're gonna, the, the, the question was, yes. We'll, we'll get to that next slide. Um, so there's also um, layouts that are, that are regular, uh, but may not be injective or subjective. So like a strided layout, which is useful for expressing a subarray. And then there's other layouts, uh, like a tiled layout, which may not even be regular. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different layouts that, that you may care about and that you may want to use. These are sort of the two primary ones. But there's a whole bunch of other layouts other than this that are important. In particular, the fact that you can express a subarray by just saying, hey, this is, a, this is an array that's, that's got a, a strided layout is very powerful. So I think that this is a true statement, that element access should be independent of the layout. And I think that's one of the problems with not only the C style examples I showed and the C++ style examples I, sh I showed, but a good number of the libraries 
um, that, that I've, I've worked with, some of them don't do a good job of, of, of hiding this uh, and really abstracting out the layout. It's a fundamental problem with Fortran. Yes, it is, it is also a fundamental problem with Fortran, although that is beyond the scope of things I'm going to try to fix. <laughs> All right, so, so like what I want is I want this instead of like this or like this. So, so who knows what this last thing here is? What's this? It is Valorite. <laughs> it is Valorite. Marshall sounded not happy when, <laughs> when that got mentioned. I think it's bold Yeah. Uh, so, so let's talk about Valorite. So let me ask this question first. Who here has used Valorite? I got one, I got two. Okay, there's written there. Tests against it. Okay, we've written tests against it. How long has Valeray been in the language? It's, it, it's since 98. I won't make you look. It's, it's since the beginning. So, Valeray is a container for numeric types uh, that was introduced in, in the original C 98 standard. It's got a, a slicing interface and it's got these optimized numeric operations for uh, like doing a, a array operation, like, at, like adding all the elements of, of uh, at doing an element, element wise add of all the elements of an array or doing an element wise multiplication of all the elements of two arrays. The idea was that like they were gonna, they were gonna optimize this and it was gonna have, they were gonna use these proxy objects, magical performance gains. Uh, there were some problems with Valeray. So there, one of the big problems was that when this was designed, expression templates were not a thing. And so this was designed and, and, and uh, put into the standard and put out there and the implement implementers learned that the proxy object approach was not particularly performant and then a bunch of people discovered expression templates and wrote these really fast uh, numerical libraries that do operations on array types using expression templates and that are just much faster than the Valeray approach and don't have all the weird caveats of Valeray. For example, so this right here works for const access to a Valeray. However, Valeray proxy objects are only required to have the const methods of, a, of the Valeray. So you can't do this for mutable access which is kind of a little bit odd and, and not something I expected to run into. So there's all sorts of weird caveats like this with these proxy objects for Valeray. And only very recently, so like in the past five years, have libraries actually had like decent implementations of Valeray. But it hasn't mattered because there have been, uh, better, uh, there have been better solutions in the form of expression template libraries. And also, uh, from, from what I, what, according to Nico's uh, book on the standard library, the library authors um, were not involved in this proposal. For the, all, the people who wrote this proposal weren't really involved um, in the committee by the time it was in the standard. So this has not really ever had a champion passed when it originally got in. Um, Marshall may correct me if I'm wrong on that, but, but that's my understanding at least. Um, Valerie was added, added before my time. I gotcha. All right, so, so I don't think Valeray is even remotely a, a solution that really works here, especially because, again, it doesn't, doesn't abstract away array layouts, which is a problem. All right, so I want to talk about the, the design goals for ArrayRef. So the first goal is that we wanted to have this be a, a, uh, a reference type, so something that's non-owning, uh, that, that's just going to reference to, it's, it can be a representation of like a C style array as the underlying thing or a vector or, you know, just uh, a pointer that was, you know, passed to you by Fortran. Um, we want it, we really care about performance. We were HPC guys, so that's pretty obvious. Um, but in particular, we have a concern about ensuring that whatever this primitive is, the compiler can auto vectorize it. And that is a, it's sort of a niche performance problem, um, but it's a very tricky one. Uh, you have to make sure that whatever abstractions you're using, that your, the compilers are able to, to see through them and that they're not going to inhibit auto vectorization. And we also, we want this to be something that follows a zero overhead principle. So in, in particular, that sort of comes into this point here that it needs to be able to support both static and dynamic extents. If you have a multi-dimensional array where you know at compile time that one of the dimensions is going to be 16, this construct should be able to exploit that information and pass it around. Uh, we, it, this is a thing with static rank. Um, it's just 
a, a, a multi-dimensional array with, with uh, dynamic crank is, is not a use case that comes up very frequently for us. And having that information at compile time is pretty useful. Um, we want something that's user and vendor extensible through uh, compile time policies. Uh, that's important for us for the, the case of supporting sort of new and exotic hardware and supporting so that the vendors can like extend this if they need to and that users can extend it so that you can implement your own uh, layouts and your own policies for access. Um, and the, the, the element access being independent of the policies is important. We want some form of minimal slicing and striding facility um, and no numerical operations. We're not going to try to be Valeray. If you need a domain-specific embedded language for array operations, go and f find one of the ones that's out there. But uh, I don't think attempting to propose a standardization of, of a, an expression template library is, is a good route to go. Um, and also, that would limit it to be something that's really very targeted for, for numerical types. You might want to support you know, non-numerical types for your multidimensional array. Yeah. So just to help me understand uh, part of the, that, that last uh, goal, um, so this would conceivably be something that a numerical library could use to model a matrix or something. Yeah, exactly. That's the idea. Yeah. Ooh, sorry. I'm, I'm probably mutilating the audio. All right. All right, so, so this is uh, ArrayRef. Uh, the paper number is P309. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to say that wrong if I try to say it any other way. So it's, it's a reference to a contiguous region of memory, which interprets and accesses the region of memory through a series of, of customization points or, or properties, as we have them called here. So the idea behind this variadic properties is that it's going to be a set of properties. And we want it to be variadic because, again, we want to have the capability for vendors to add vendor-specific properties, uh, which then users can, which they can provide vendor-specific properties and then like policies that, that, that correspond to those, those properties and uh, that users can also extend those. And we also want to have a standard set of, of properties as well. So stuff like basic layout, things like bounds checking. Um, one of the, the things about this variadic set is if there's any void argument in here, we just ignore it so that you can, ha you can conditionally enable one of these properties. So you could have some, some metaprogramming to determine whether or not this array should have bounds checking on. And if, if you don't want it on, you just have your meta function return void, and then it just ignores it. All right, so let's look at how we'd use this thing. So this is uh, for just replacing uh, one-dimensional statically sized arrays. So like you've got some C style APIs, some C++ style APIs, and, and you can express this, these APIs through, through an array ref type. And so we've just got this array ref of T of N here, and it looks very nice. And then, of course, you've got the const version here which has the, sort of those semantics that, that you'd expect. Those, the, um, it's sort of similar to unique pointer semantics if you've got like a const uh, unique pointer. Um, and then this is what it looks like for dynamically sized one-dimensional arrays. Again, pretty straightforward. You can, you can replace like these horrible APIs that are all over my code bases. So this is... <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay. Fair point. Fair point. All right. So let's let's look at how we declare this thing in particular, how we specify the dimensions. So for the 1D case, this is pretty straightforward. So this is for, for static uh, dimensions here. So we've got like TN, so you've expressed this compile time information. And then for dynamic dimensions, we're just going to use an, an empty bracket notation here. So this, this works. This is nice and pretty elegant. All right, so what about like this? Does, does this all work? Is everybody happy with this? That's right, which other example doesn't compile? Oh, it used to compile. He doesn't compile either. Uh, he does. That's right, yeah. Yeah, because the rule is only the first dimension of an array type may have dynamic size. So, in particular, so like, yeah, those ones don't work. So we have this one slides so like this one it's only the first so like this one's fine because it's only the first dimension but this one third dimension second second it's like none of these work so this is kind of unfortunate because this is a very nice concise syntax and uh, the you don't like the syntax I, I, I understand why this doesn't work it's like how do you index this 
Um, but the thing is, so this is just metaprogramming. Like, we don't need this type to be a complete type. We do, this is just like syntactic sugar. So if, if only these were incomplete types, but that we were like allowed to, 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 to use them in this fashion, that would be quite nice. Uh, all right, so there's a bunch of different bad approaches for how you can, uh, you can specify dimensions if you don't have this. We think this is the least bad approach, which is that you've got uh, some, some class like this. It's like a dimen dimensions class, and it's one of the properties that gets passed to an array ref. And it's a type that represents the dimensions of a multidimensional space. So it's, it's something that we want to support both static and dynamic extents. Uh, so what that means is we're going to need to have some way of specifying that, that we have a dynamic extent, which means we need some like magic value here because we're, we've got this per yep. Modifying the size of them as well? Uh, no. Why would you be? So then what does it matter? Um, slicing? Then you return your work. I'm not, I'm not sure. I, so the, you're, you're, the, David was asking about, about modifying the size of these. I'm not sure I understand. Uh, uh, you sure? Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, all right, so we want this to support both static and dynamic extents. Which means we need a we need a way to to represent in this parameter pack that that one of these extents is is going to be dynamic and that we're going to fill in that information later. Um, and one one of the other things with with this is that we want this to uh, if it if you've got a if if it's a static extent you shouldn't need any storage or or any any runtime state for this. So like if you've got if this is a dimensions uh, class where it's like all com uh, static. Um, then there shouldn't be some like tuple that's empty under the hood. It should just be it should just be, you know, size of one. Um, so I, so I'd I'd like to to enforce that that that, that optimization has to be made in some fashion. And how is this different from an integer sequence? Um, so it's different, but because depending on whether or not it's dynamic or not. So the question is, how is this different from an integer sequence? If if this thing, if one of the, if there's so there's some magic value that says this thing has dyna a dynamic extent, and if that, call it minus one. <laughs> yeah, so we'll call it we'll call it minus one. Um, so if you have one of those minus ones, then you need to have some storage to store the runtime value. Okay. So um, this looks this looks like it's easy to implement. It was not. Yeah. It's very tricky and requires a lot of metaprogramming. As I said, it, it looks what, that looks like an integer sequence to me. Yeah. Clearly, it's not. Yeah, there's a bunch of naive implementations of this that work very easily, like you could just have a tuple under the hood, but um, the proper implementation is, is, is tricky. Yeah. Why is it a tuple? Because then you've got some, you've got some storage for, for this that, you, that I don't, you don't need and that I don't want you to have to, I don't want you to carry around. Because in particular, I want an array ref for a uh, for a statically sized for all statically sized dimensions to be size of a pointer, and that's that's you don't need anything else. You have all the information you need. All the other, all the other, all the sizes are embedded in the type. Yep. Yes. Yep. All right. So let's look at using this. So imagine that our that we're going to call our magic value dynamic extent. Uh, so like for for the static case, this isn't too horrible. It's a little bit more verbose. Um, for the dynamic case, it gets to be pretty bad. Like I tried to have this example be a 3D example, but then this was like three or four lines. So like having this, like having some named magic value, I don't think is, is a good idea. So let's get rid of that. What else can we do? How about zero? <laughs> Question. Yeah. What are the four parameters there to that? Uh, remember when I said remember when I said this used to be 3D? Okay. <laughs> yes. So there should be two there should be two parameters there, and those two parameters are the dynamic dimensions. Okay. N and M. I, I yeah. N and M. I, yeah. The L was there. See, see, I wasn't I wasn't joking. This really was a three dimensional example at one point, and it was too long. All right. So let's talk about using zero as a magic value here. Um, so I've tried that. And let, let's, let's defer that discussion until like three slides later when we talk about why it doesn't work. Let's just talk about zero for now. Does, is zero an acceptable magic value here? Yes. Okay. D I heard some no's. Can At least bad. All right. Um, as Sean pointed out yesterday, zero, zero size arrays are a common extension. 
think yes. you run afoul of those if you use zero. Uh, so Marshall's comment was that zero size arrays are a common extension and will run afoul of those if you use zero. My counterpoint to that would be I would find it acceptable if we standardize the very common extension so that then we could use that syntax. Um, so we're, we're between a rock and a hard place and like this is the, this is the best thing we can use given the constraints. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we, we'll, we'll talk about that in a slide or two. Um, I actually think that that one should be feasible, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure if it's, compi compilers make it not feasible. Um, and I'm not sure if, if, uh, if it's actually not allowed by the language or, or if, if it should work, but doesn't. Um, all right, so yeah, there are some caveats here. The, the caveat in particular is that there may be cases where you really want to express a dimension of size zero. Now you can still do that with this. The only caveat is that when you're, if you're expressing a dimension of size zero with this construct, it will, it will be a dynamic dimension of size zero. So if, even if it's static, you won't be able to, to pass that information around. There's only one case where I think that may have performance implications. Otherwise, it's like it's, it's um, from a, like a conceptual purity standpoint, it's kind of crappy, but I don't think it actually is uh, inhibiting. Um, but I'm, I'm more than open to, to any of the small language changes that would let us have the nicer syntax. All right, so let's, let's look. So like this again, so this one doesn't work, this one doesn't work. We support all the ones that do work, and then these are all the ones that correspond to, to like these here, and we support, and then these correspond to the ones that don't work here. So pretty, pretty straightforward. So this is all the, these are sort of the other four approaches. There's one other approach which, uh, which Cocos actually uses, but I, I have neglected, neglected to talk about that one. Um, so like the first approach here is that you just do this and you just use zero. The problem with, or, or so the problem with this one is that it's not actually allowed because arrays of, of size zero are not allowed in the language. Now this works on pretty much all the compilers I've tried, but it's not, it's not allowed. So. We can't do this. <laughs> All right, so we can presumably do this with some dynamic extent that's not zero, which basically means it has to be negative one. The problem with this is that all, even if you're not instantiating this type, every compiler I've tried will complain if n times m times dynamic extent is a ridiculous value. Um, now it shouldn't because you're not using the type anywhere. I'm just using it for metaprogramming. Um, so I don't think it should yell at me for that. It doesn't have to, like, you sh that should just work, but it doesn't. And the other issue is like, then we'd have to like either write dynamic extent or like negative one here, and that would be that would be weird too. So, yeah, uh, but then you, then you open up arguments of uh, bike shedding arguments. What what are you going to? Uh, three three characters is my limit. I, I would be willing to accept a, a magic value if if the name can be three characters. Then there's like this version here and this version. So like this one does this one would kind of work, but we have those variadic properties. Those are pretty important to us, and that keeps this from working. And then this one could kind of work, and you could use uh, template argument type deduction so that dynamic extent here could uh, be so you like template auto t or template auto dot 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 t, and then like this could instead of being a value, it could be a type. So that would work. But again, we have those variadic properties that we kind of care about. There may be other ways that we could use. Like you could use um, template uh, uh, argument type deduction in the dimensions class, but then you have this long identifier that's ugly that I don't want. So that approach doesn't really work there either because I don't think I can get like a three letter identifier for this magic value. Yes. So in, in this design, are you trying to maximize the number of people that are going to actually use this? Or are you yes. trying to maximize this capability? Um, those, those go the, qu the question was, are we going to maximize the, its capability or the number of people are going to use it? I'm going to punt to Carter on this. Yes, both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those, those two design criteria go against each other. Like, people, if you want to maximize the ability, that second to last ones, or the last one, or the bottom two are the ones that people are like, oh yeah, multi-dimensional array, I can, I can deal with that. If we want to maximize usability, we need the, the yeah. change so we can use empty brackets. So, yeah, and I mean, a lot of things are. We those last two things aren't terrible. They aren't terrible, but they substantially restrict our ability to use this for a bunch of use cases that we think are not only relevant, but are going to become relevant to the broader programming community in coming years. Like, like the, the idea of having a flat memory space is going to be going away. 
you're gonna have you're gonna have future you know regular Intel Xeon uh, uh, architectures are gonna probably have high bandwidth memory that you're gonna have to figure out how to utilize and how to program with, or you're not gonna be fully exploiting the chip. But that's one particular use case. It, it is, but but it's a use case that that um, is. People are having to deal with a more complicated thing. I, I'm just pointing out, uh, I'm wondering what you're, you're trying to get the best of both worlds, but it seems like it's leaning towards. I, I hear you. Uh, I, I, I think me and Carter both feel that, that uh, having the support for properties is very important. Yes. And I don't think that, that, that that's something that we want to drop. By the way, three letters for your magic value is that including the namespace identifier? <laughs> I, I don't. <laughs> so we, a lot of our properties are in an array property namespace, and we actually do have one three character identifier there. Um, I guess there are like three character like we could stick it in like an array property namespace and like then it would be fine but I, I really don't I don't want it to even be three characters I, I lied I, I really want uh, I really want this syntax um, yeah I so that that's what it was called in the reference implementation for a while and and in some branches of it it may still be called dyn yeah all right let me move on okay all right so Pretty straightforward how you construct these things. So basically, all the constructors are pointer plus um, set of properties or like set of dimensions that get forwarded to to the properties. So this is all pretty straightforward. This is for just statically sized 1D arrays. Uh, this is for uh, dynamically sized 1D arrays. Again, pretty straightforward stuff here. Um, this is for a multi-dimensional array for for a statically sized one. So we got our dimensions here, passing the buffer. <coughs> For the um, dynamic one, passing the the we've got zero zero, passing the sizes here. Wait, wait, wait. Back. Yep. You've got a constructor that actually takes a vector, not a pointer. There. Um. Yes. This okay. example has an issue. Um. We did have that constructor at one point, but yeah, this. As opposed to buff one date dot data. data. Yeah. Okay, just check. It's pseudocode. <laughs> <laughs> Specify, let's say, a three-dimensional dimensions with, like, let's say, the first zero and then two and then zero. You mean something, something like this? So, uh, no, no, you need three dimensions. And if the two of them are dynamic. Two of them being dynamic. You figure out the, which one is reverse right. those two. You do, you do them in order. Yeah. You, they, you specify them in the order that they're the, that they're declared. It's but do you have a full width constructor where you throw away all the arguments that are in zero? No. That's annoying. Uh, sorry. Uh, we can talk about it later, but we, we currently don't have that. Um, it's, I don't know whether or not it would make sense to have, yes. So if you were going to do something like that, I would propose that you do something like require auto and have a make array function that takes some kind of static integer, correct? Yeah, I've been thinking about that, about that too. Um, there's probably some set of helper make array functions that we need. Yeah. Um, yeah, OK. All right, so this one is, so this is the more explicit form where like uh, if you have properties that uh, you need to pass in, like maybe you have a dynamic bounds checking property where it's got, you need to pass it a constructor argument of like true or false to, to enable or disable it. And so this, this version of the constructor would, would take a pointer and then uh, a set of, of properties. So like dimensions is one of these properties that would get passed in here. So this would be one way of, of constructing an array ref. Um, all right, so this is sort of the, the equivalent of, the, of a vector or a container's size and capacity interface. So you've got rank, tells you what the rank is. A rank dynamic tells you what, what, how many of the dimensions are dynamic. Then you've got um, a, this extent function, which returns to you one of the dimensions. Um, and so, yes, this one, this one, if it goes out of bounds, it's uh, just, I don't know how we have it. In, it's probably just undefined behavior in the way we have it written in the spec, but I'm not sure if that's, that's correct. But, but so this, and these are all const expert, no except functions. And then size here is um, just going to return the product of the extents. So in this case, it's just like n times m times l. And so then you've also got these. So stride tells you what's, what's the stride of each one of these dimensions. So the, the default here is row major. So here the last, uh, the last dimension is unit stride. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Span here is, is kind of interesting. So span uh, will 
tell you, it's sort of like capacity. So like if you've got like a strided uh, array graph that like refers to like a slice of some bigger space, then span would refer to what's the, the shape of that bigger space. And so then span wouldn't be equal to size. But for like a basic array graph where, where it's, it's regular and injective, then span is going to be equal to size. All right, so for indexing, we've got, um, for 1D uh, array refs, we've got an, a regular indexing operator, but then we're using the call operator as our primary indexing operator. Uh, that's pretty straight straightforward. Um, I believe we'd have people object in the past to that because that it's supposed to represent a function call, but really this is sort of a function call. It's ma a mapping function. Um, let's see. And so, okay, so iterators. So this is a, a, a controversial part of the talk. Um, so an array ref which is contiguous provides you with random access iterators and all other array refs don't give you iterators. Um, and there's also no multi-dimensional iterator. So the iterator that you get is just sort of it iterates through all the elements. And it's not an, it's not an iterator where you can go like and you can move in a different direction. It's just going to go through it in unit stride. Um, the reason for this is that multi-dimensional iterators are tricky. Um, so I'm going to go through a brief sketch of like what it would look like to have to implement a multidimensional iterator. So like we've got some, some multidimensional iterators, some template parameters, ignore that. Its state is going to be like it's going to have the array ref that it refers to, and then it's going to have some multi-index that it needs to maintain, right? So then this is what its like internal increment needs to look like. So it goes to the, uh, this is for, for, a, for a row major, uh, uh, multi-dimensional array iterator. So it goes to the index of least stride, it increments it, it checks if that index is at the end of that particular bound. If it is, then it sets it to zero, and then it goes and increments the, the next uh, least stride uh, index, and then it goes and repeats that ad nauseum. So th this is... Yes, this is why we don't do this. So I'll, I'll try to explain why um, this is a problem um, by Second. yeah. Uh, why don't you implement single-dimensional iterators that, on the reference, return a sliced array, which is what I would expect. Uh, you, this is a specific linearization of your multi-dimensional space. What you've just so what what you can do is we you can use our you can do the other thing where you can take a subarray. Uh, you can slice down and then iter and then iterate over the sliced down one. Yeah. So we we don't so we don't support that particular pattern, but we support the inverse of that, where you have the array and you slice it down to like a one D array and then iterate over that. Sure. Um, I think that's a less weird pattern than having like the iterator that's like a, the slicing iterator. But something that's that's something to to talk about. Yeah, that's we haven't looked at that particular solution. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to move on because I want to, I, I got, I got slides that Carter's got to talk about too. <laughs> Alright, so I'm going to go through this one, ex this quickly. This is, I think, the, uh, a good example of why uh, this sort of iterator won't work. So this is like a stencil. Alright, so I've got this stencil where each iteration I need to touch nine points. Right? So if I try to turn this into some iterator paradigm, the issue that I have is that, so now, so now I've replaced this with I've got some iterators here. I've got nine different places where I'm calling all of those um, loop condition checks. And now I've got to rely on the compiler to both like figure out, oh, I don't need to do these checks nine times, and also to figure out that it's OK to auto vectorize this. Whereas this version here, um, it's, it, you know, one, the compiler is very good at auto vectorizing loops, and two, it, like, the loop condition uh, checks are, are not being, like, I'm not writing, I want them to, I want to do them nine times. So, I, this is, I think, the reason why these multidimensional iterators don't really, don't really work, yes. Um, I'm okay, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that for a, the first implementation. And you get it out there, and people start using it, and and then, you know, you'll get screens, and, and you'll see, and, and you'll get use cases. And then you can say, okay, this is a pattern, we can try this, or this is a pattern, we can try this, you know. Uh, get, get something first and iterate. 
I would use the term. I would rather I would rather not try to specify a, uh, this complicated multidimensional iterator and instead provide the these iterators that we've said here and then get it out there. Yeah. That's, I'm agreeing with you. Okay. Oh, that's what. Yes. I, okay. Good. Yeah. Do, do what you know how to do and and say this is hard. We don't know how to do it right. Yeah. And so we're not going to do it at all right now. Yes. Okay. So we're in agreement. Wonderful. All right. Um, I'm going to skip over this part because I'm a little low on time. Uh, all right, talking about layouts quickly, we've got four basic layouts that we have in the spec. Uh, layout left, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, that's the, the, the default one, the row major one. What? The left and right are reversed. God, did I do that again? Uh, no, they're not. Right is column major, left is... What are you talking about earlier? Anyway. That, that's how it is in the spec. We can go back and look at your slides 20 back. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, I didn't bring it up then, but let's move uh, on. I'm pretty sure this is right. We'll have to, we'll have to check <laughs> later. Yeah. Um, I knew there was going to be at least one, one bug of that nature here. We've got a row major and a column major layout <laughs> with a, a name that, with names that are to be determined. And we've got a layout order. So this is the one where you say like which, what the order uh, of uh, the dimensions is that you want to use. That's, that's how you could express like um, I want I to be unit stride, then I want K to be the, the next smallest stride, and then I want J to be the largest stride. Um, and there are, there are use cases where, where you, you want that. Uh, then layout stride is where you explicitly specify which, what each of the strides is going to be uh, through, the, through the constructor of layout stride. I'm going to skip over that slide. So this is uh, pretty straightforward uh, with this potentially being uh, wrong. Um, but so the nice thing here is that we've got you know, the element access is completely independent of the layout here. The only thing that, the only method here that's really going to change depending on the layout um, in terms of like what it's going to give you is going to be the stride of telling you what the stride of each one of these dimensions is. Yes, um, you can do that. Yeah, yeah. That the, the, the question was, can you tile this array without changing the, the access? And the answer is yes. And the question back there? Does the copy constructor do the uh, remap? Um, the, the question was, does the copy constructor... Right? You know, it's going to remap under the hood? Copy constructor does not copy data. The, yeah, the copy constructor does not copy data. Because it's an array ref, reference type. So like... It's, it's just, it's just uh, referring to some memory. When you copy it, it's not copying the underlying thing. So I could have an array which doesn't, if I copy it, I assign something else, it's not, not going to reflect what's actually stored under the hood. Right, right. Okay. It, it, is, it is, an array ref is your interpretation of the array. Okay. All right, so there's some other properties uh, like bounds checking that might be useful. So like this would say like do bounds checking on the, uh, on the call operator. Um, and then you, the idea of having uh, of this of a layer of ignoring void is that you can have like some conditional check here, and then you can just stick it in here, and and if it's void, it's fine. And uh, so this is one uh, that I think might be a useful thing to have. I I didn't learn this until I looked into what how Valeray is specified. Valeray is specified to not alias, and so having having some property like this, which if if it's specified for the array ref, you say this thing is an alias, would be useful. Um, I'm going to talk quickly about this. This is our subarray uh, interface. So the idea here is you, you pass in subarray some array ref and then some set of slice specifiers. And each slice specifier is either this special thing called all, or it's an integral value, or it's a range of integral values. So the rank of the returned array ref here is one less than the rank of this array ref for each slice specifier, which is a, just a single integer value. So let me show some examples so that that makes sense to people. All right, so this is, this is just a pretty basic one. So I've got like subarray A here. And what I'm actually saying is like, all right, give me like this inner box here. It's like cut off like one element on each end of this box here. And this is unit stride. And so this one is still ranked two. And this one is now not contiguous, though, because we've, we've got to have some amount of, of striding here. And so then this all just says, I don't, I don't want you to slice anything in this dimension. So this one, again, pretty straightforward. All right, so now here we've got one where we've specified an integral value. So I've said I've got this one here. And so 
what now this will give you a, a th an array of rank one because you you don't need to say like you're only look this array is only going to be indexing through this space here um, so it's a, I think it's a very powerful tool for for uh, for for like getting down to a smaller array that you want to work with, and especially for for uh, for working with numerical kernels, um, and so then here's the other the example from the other case. So one of the patterns that um, we use a lot at the lab is like we don't we try to not do we try to lift the indexing as far up into the loop as possible. So in particular, we wouldn't want to do this indexing calculation here because we can do part of it up here, and so we can do this with the subarray. And so uh, I like this because then like. In this loop here, I'm, I'm just, I'm, well, there's the, the J here because it's a matrix vector multiply. But, um, but the idea is that for, for this here, I've, I've moved the, uh, the integer multiply up here. It may not matter for the 2D case, but like for a 4D case, um, we've run into cases where the auto vectorizer will auto vectorize all of your uh, indexing logic instead of auto vectorizing all of your actual numerics. Yeah? In what in what in what sense? And you have uh, one index when you, uh, one index less to mm -hmm. to access your element. Yes. So is there any chance to just go to a one time n matrix? Uh, to, to an n vector? Uh, that's something that we could potentially have. Yeah. So the question was was um, that in generic code you might not want to drop the rank. Um, and that it would be nice to maybe have a version of this that that ev even if you that when you slice down it's going to always say the same uh, the same number of ranks. But that will happen if you're doing if you have the same uh, I guess one and two index in what in the braces because if you're writing generic code and you don't want to drop ranks you'll be bracing it you won't be just specifying data. Uh, it, it's a type of that 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 is correct, um, and and that's one of the that's one of the things that that I've I've debated whether or not it's a loophole that should be fixed, uh, like to check whether whether the ranges are actually ranges or whether they're just they've got just got one element. Question in the back, and then I'm going to hand it over to Carter. Yeah, so the question: it, it looks like all the iteration schemes here are rectangular, and my question is: well, what if you're let's say you're adding uh, a lower triangular and upper triangular matrices together? The operation is. Um, I'm going to let Carter answer that question. <laughs> so, would you repeat that for a second, then I can repeat. So, you said it, so the use case was triangular matrices, or is triangular? Yeah, yeah, but, uh, generally speaking, sometimes it would be nice uh, if you have a array where you communicate not just the range, the, the size, of, the, the size of, of your selection, but also its shape. So, triangular is an example of a shape where the number of operations you'd want to do, let's say, in multiplication, would be less than normal. And, and a similar question I guess you could ask is uh, if you have, um, uh, sorry, that, that's, that's got, well, well okay. the triangular ones are. So the triangular use case, let me give an example on my colleagues, and this is an extension point that he did for a uh, layout is he had symmetric matrices and he did not want to he wanted to cut his storage in half so he did actually a symmetric layout which would take the indexing from the upper triangular portion and fold it down to the lower triangular portion so an, an irregular layout but now all of the code looks as though it were a rectangular matrix or a square matrix but it's, and the storage under the hood was half the size and uh, what, what I was going to ask is it looks like if you're doing let's say you're doing a transposed plus b it looks like with the memory layouts here, you could uh, avoid calculating the actual transpose because you could have an array view which does the effective transposition and then do the addition there. To transpose the indices, yes. OK. So let's see. Just one more question. Yes. OK. Um, are you planning to interpret negative indices as from the back so that you don't have to the extent yourself before that turned out to be really, really nice. So this is a discussion that's happened over the many times over the years and comes down to if you want to support and the question was about negative indices. Thank you. <laughs> so the so over the year this has come up many times over the years because in grid and uh, find a different stencil grid operations they do negative indices. So the discussion and Bryce I even had that discussion recently. So for what we're proposing for the array ref, 
it's just the all extents are 0 to n, or 0 to n minus 1. And if you need something for ch such as a grid abstraction where you can do negative indices, you put that as a thin layer over the, a thin facade over the array to get your negative indices. So we don't want to propose that for the fundamental capability. That's a domain specific thing. Okay. We're on the same page with that. And, ah, good. Okay. So I'm going to quickly go through this so I can get to the second part because it was an inspiration. So we started this 2010 and it was based on uh, work from years before that going into the Cocos Library in a multidimensional, why did we do this, why did we have the layout, and then what impact it has, the lessons learned we've had going into this. So this is a library, it's out on GitHub, this is what we're doing for our um, fundamental performance portability across all these architectures that the DOE is throwing at us. We've been told that we have to take our application code base, we're going to, they will let us rewrite that code base one time, and when we finish rewriting it one time, it must run well on all of those architectures. <laughs> one code base. So this is a window of opportunity because they do not, do, not, do not like paying taxpayer dollars to rewrite codes. <laughs> So we get one shot at it. So Cocos is the, is the, our one shot at this to make it work. So some people have asked, what is Cocos? It's a, uh, abstraction is, it's a Greek term meaning the finest grain you can get to. Like if you pick up sand on a beach, the gra it's an adjective describing the granularity. So what we're looking at is, the, is being able to do distributed linear parallelism using MPI or whatever the case may be, and then do on-node parallelism with Cocos, and that Cocos, uh, we have to map, we, the, let's see, does the pointer work on this thing? Sure. Ah, very good. Okay, so what we have, the contract we have with the application is that it's going to identify the finest grain of parallelizable computations and data. So computation, co computational bodies and data, and then we're going to map those computations onto cores and data into memory. So. You just heard a whole lot about data mapping. So multidimensional array mapping and computational mapping, and we do those things together. Let me flip through here really quickly. Um, so mapping of parallel computations, uh, if you go back to the parallel patterns book, we use that with extensibility. Execution policy says it's not, so the pattern isn't enough. You have to tell how you're gonna, uh, how you're gonna execute those things. Do you do static scheduling, dynamic scheduling, thread team scheduling, et cetera? Execution space, this is getting into these modern architectures. Uh, where the computational is going to occur, when I, when I say, and if you look into the, what's being proposed in the parallelism TS, there's this execution policy. So that's kind of getting into these, these combination of things here that says where do you want to execute this? What cores do you want to execute if you're doing a subset of cores? Executor type stuff. Whether you want to launch it to a GPU, which GPU in a multi-GPU system, et cetera. Memory space, this is getting more fun because we're getting a lot more kinds of memory that are going to be on this. So we need to be able to say, where does your data reside? Layout, we just had a whole lot of discussion about layout. So I'll, be, I'll skip over that for now. And the differentiating thing we've got is we do uh, layouts and memory spaces in this library. So just as an illustration, if you haven't had to deal with multiple memory spaces before, uh, I hope you will start getting used to it, at least be sensitive to those of us who have to, or have to deal with it. So here's an example of some execution of memory spaces. Um, so multi-core architecture and DDR, with it prefers to run on that. We have a GPU attached. It has this GDDR and shared memory, so we have three memory spaces here we have to deal with. And depending on how you convert, can, uh, configure the system, you may be able to have to use uh, deep copies like a, a CUDA mem copy to be able to do this. Or if you start using UVM and pen memory, then you can do direct accesses. So there's, it's not just hardware configuration, it's runtime and hardware configuration on these things. Um, ah, okay. So row major, column major, went through all of this stuff. Hopefully you're familiar with it. What we need and we found uh, we've got to have is a polymorphic layout on this place. The user's got to be able to ex extend this to be able to do tiling, to be able to do striding, to be able to do folding over symmetric matrices so you only get uh, store half the storage on these, these gigabyte arrays as necessary. And I mentioned this uh, going into, so this is where we need to be able to use, boy, I'm having a hard time with your pointer here. Um, be able to do atomic, uh, be able to use special, uh, special hardware 
or special aspects of the runtime and be able to ver make it very easy for users to get access to this. There we go. So how important is layout? If you haven't discovered this yet in terms of your performance, this is a uh, pseudocode for a computational kernel and a molecular dynamics code, just a small mini application. So when we ran this on, with we, when we told Cocos to use the wrong layout, we would get this level of performance on these different architectures. We let Cocos default to use the correct layout for the different architecture. Turns out these are layout right. These are layout. These are row major. This is column major. <laughs> we'll have to discuss that left and right. Uh, no, yeah, I checked. You are correct. <laughs> ah, okay. So this is then. So this is when you use the proper layout. What kind of throughput you can get on this kernel. And then if you look on this kernel. One of these guys is a random access. This J is going into a lookup table where you're doing random access, but it's read-only random access. Well, if you go to one of these GPU systems, there's some special hardware paths to be able to do really good read-only random access. And so if we, act, if we actually can take this access path and run it through the GPU, the texture fetch unit, we can suddenly get a huge boost in performance. So being able to access all this hardware and the right layout is, in, is incredible, incredibly important. Uh, low, this zero overhead, incredibly low overhead, very important as well. Um, let's see. Uh, we'll skip it in the interest of time. OK. So this is, I think this is an important part. So when we map parallel, we have to map parallel computations and data. So it's not sufficient. Thank you. So it's not sufficient to, do, to map the data or the parallel computations. You've got to do both at the same time. So the, what we do is we have our, our parallel patterns, this policy, execute from 0 to n minus 1, and then execute the body and pass it saying, OK, this is your computational body. This is the grain of computation which can be made parallel. So we do parallel for, parallel reduce, parallel scan, and then we have data parallel execution policies. So this n is actually a default for a range policy which says go from 0 to n. Uh, to n. We have other kinds of policies, hierarchical execution policies, uh, where the n, uh, that's what I mentioned right here, the n implies it. So it's, it's comparable, the, simpl the simplicity is comparable to marking up with OpenMP. Instead of doing a pragma parallel, you, you replace 4 with parallel 4. Um, interest of time, I'm going to have to skip on this thing. Uh, let's, ah, multidimensional array. Okay, so this was the other syntax. This is the syntax we had to resort to since we can't do empty brackets. When we first implemented this in 2010, they actually the GNU was quite happy with empty brackets. No problems at all. And I'll, then I mentioned this at one of the, the C++, ISO C++ meetings that, oh, we've had, we're using this empty bracket syntax and GNU was happy with it. Well, GNU 5 all of a sudden took it away. <laughs> so, because it was a... <laughs> Because it was a mistake. <laughs> and it was a, it was a useful mistake. Yeah, but that doesn't change the fact. <laughs> it doesn't. Anyway, so, so, but it actually had absolutely no problems with, with doing it, but it, it vi technically violated the standard. So we had to switch from using empty brackets to using this notation, which is the least bad for notation. But what it does is it says that dynamic dimensions must always lead static dimensions, which is constraining, but we've been living with that, but at least we're getting concise syntax. Our users, we always have to have this discussion about why they can't use empty brackets. <laughs> and unfortunately, um, as soon as we're trying to get that back, and hopefully this, this proposal is a motivation to get that back to allow it as an incomplete type. Uh, so that we, that we access using the parentheses operator. And now what we also do is we enfor enforce space as one of these properties. So if you're, running a GP, if you're running on the GPO, GPU and the space is host, we'll generate an error rather than a seg fault, or vice versa. So which our users are extremely happy with not getting seg faults when they, when they violate memory spaces and getting actual uh, understandable errors. And then we have optional array bounds checking so we can turn this on for debugging, which is also extremely hap uh, helpful. One of the problems with turning on global bounds checking is that if you have a whole lot of computational kernels and only one of them is going bad, then you suddenly take, uh, instead of getting 10 seconds to get to the code that's the problem, you now got to wait 10 or 20 minutes to get to the code that's a problem. So you want to be able to selectively turn on bounds checking in your kernels, not just everywhere. 
Uh, our view semantics that we've got are analogous to shared pointers. So you can actually um, do uh, shared ownership among these things. There was a mention about deep copy. So this is the shout. This is basically pointer to pointer, shared pointer to shared pointer. And if you want to copy data, we always have explicit deep copy syntax to say, go down to what's being referenced and copy the contents. So this is a shallow copy. This is the deep copy. Um, so the layout mapping we've got in there, that's already been described. So now we can have a view with the array type, the layout, and the space. And for example, a tiling is a, is a pretty important one. Subview. So we do the subview, which was done. So these ranges and indices argument list. And then, so we are, that was already discussed. We do pairs or the um, initializer. We override initializer or take C's initializer list to do that as well. Now this access properties. So if any of you have actually tried to deal with CUDA GPU texture, uh, texture programming, I mean tech, using that, it is incredibly ugly and difficult. Our users have been extremely happy to know that all they have to do, and found this very useful, is to mark it const, give us the random access hint, and then now the parentheses operator is now overloaded to run through the GPU texture unit. Just that simple. So the way we get uh, the performance portability across these architectures is by composing parallel execution mapping. How do we map those computational kernel bodies onto cores or onto the GPU threads or onto the CPU threads, whatever the case may be, and how do you do the layout? So we map both in a coordinated fashion such that when that closure gets called, the contract is that they use the closures index that we give them as their parallel index, and that is the index that they, the first index that they stick in their array. And we will stride the array properly for the particular architecture. So when they recompile to a new architecture, we change the layout such that the best performance is given by in striding this guy according to the parallel work index. Okay, getting to the meat of this. So, let's see, what we'd really like to have, so, Think about taking this array property dimensions and using some kind of special dynamic extent. Now we have uh, applications that have rank six arrays and they know that some of these things are dynamic but one of them is not and they don't want to give out the performance by have not having this. So imagine trying to, what it's going to look like in a, for an engineer, mathematician, scientist to have to take and do this kind of thing with this dynamic extent argument instead of this. <laughs> You can see line after line after line after line as opposed to doing something at least compact as this. Okay, so the preferred syntax it actually is a trivial change, um, very trivial change in the compiler. So Bryce found that he just had to, it's a one line change in Clang just to quit making it an error and leave it in complete type. GNU used to support it until I told them about it and they quit supporting it. <laughs> and all we need is to say that if you, if you omit any static bound after the first dimension, that's an, that's an incomplete type. Done. Okay. Um, so some of the things we know, let's see. Ah, when the array ref, okay, so there was a, a, param a parameter inside, a type def inside the array ref proposal, which is called reference. And that is the type which is returned by the indexing operator. So when is this thing not an L value? Why do we have this and why is it not an L value? When, when is the value type and the reference type not just an L value reference to the value type? For example, when you do this const array random access and we're pulling things through the GPU texture unit, it's going to be returned by a value, not by a const L value reference in this case. And so the reference type has to be different than an L value reference to the value type. And that's, so that's why we have the, the different types in here. Uh, another use case we'd like to be able to do is instead of having to take and dereference and then run all these things through a, an atomic view concept to be able to say, okay, I want my accesses to be atomic. That's going to be not a null value reference now. So what we'd want this thing to do is return an atomic view concept. That's another uh, option. So then you can do a, uh, i comma j comma k dot fetch value. But we don't want these things to be we don't want the array, the array type to be atomic. We want the operations on those members to be atomic. 
and some other things. Um, let's see. So one thing that would be very helpful to know in terms of metaprogramming, instead of having to do an a stood is L value reference, to be able to say, just ask whether it is or not. Uh, shared ownership. So this is a controversial one. Bryce and I don't agree on this yet. We'll come to some agreement at some point on a way of doing this. Because our users have found it extremely, extremely valuable not to have to deal with multiple classes or go in this case where you, you have a stood vector and you extract the data out of it and then you stick it in the array ref. Now you're carrying around array ref to do multi-indexing and you have to carry around the stood vector so the memory doesn't go away and you end up pairing these things together and carrying them around together. Okay, why can't the array ref or whatever this thing is, we call it a view, just carry around all that information together. And so what we do, so one possibility is to put uh, like an array property shared and that point now all you have to do is once you've, you can allocate the thing, give the, give the deleter to the array ref, the array ref carries around the deleter when the reference count goes to zero, destroys it, now you have to carry around both objects at once. You just have the array ref carry around everything that it needs. Now if you were to put this property on, then you would need uh, to add a use count. So one of the things that in terms of extension of pro when you add properties, that might need necessitate adding uh, new ways of constructing or new uh, methods that appear on it. Uh, memory space, we know this one is going to have to come in real quickly. And this is the, to be able to put in, introduce, to be able to say this, this array reference act means is an array ref to the GPU space or to the H high bandwidth memory space or to NVRAM that's attached. So that way that there can be reasoning about what is accessible and what is not accessible. And I'm about to run out of that. So it'd be nice if we could extend the concept of a memory resource to handle this kind of thing. So we have the space. Um, performance hit properties, it would be very nice to be able to say, oh, this array ref, I, as the user, I agree that this is not, that, that I'm not going to alias that I can put a restrict on here and be able to carry that around and have the compiler be able to reason about it would be very nice. Uh, random access, checking bounds. If we could have these properties, it's a whole lot, I believe, a whole lot easier to manage those kind of property extensions than it is to try and stick attribute lists on array objects. Um, let's see, so once we start having more properties, we're going to be able to do need to be able to manipulate this property packs. So like say, I've got this array in my metaprogramming, I've got an array, com array ref coming in, I want to add cons to it, or array ref coming in, I want to add uh, random access to it because that's how I intend to use it. Uh, we already talked about layout mapping. Okay, cut to the chase. So, something we need to do for foundational com for the foundational capability is to be able to get the dimension in and be able to get the predefined standard layout. So, if we can at least get this thing into the standard to begin with, or at least into the TS going on to the next standard as soon as we can, now that gives us a foundation from which we can begin building and begin extending. Uh, next thing is really need to be able to relax this and get incomplete uh, array type declarations to be able to use them in the interface so we don't have to go be using this thing. The engineers, scientists, mathematicians, they're not going to be happy with this. I, mean, I already know that because we've showed it to them and they were not happy with it. Uh, <laughs> shared ownership, Bryce, we'll have to be talking about that. Uh, memory space. We're going to be needing memory spaces to get on these new architectures, be able to effectively use these new architectures. Performance hit uh, properties, extensibility of layout. So this, this is still, um, when users extend the layout for us, there's a, a challenge that they've got to be able to extend the subarray and integrate new layouts and subarray notation. That is a challenge which we need some more experience before we uh, say that there's going to, instead of using standard layouts, to be able to have user extensible layouts. So we've got a little more work to do on figuring out how to handle that properly. Okay, now I'm done. <laughs> that was a whirlwind, but hopefully you got the gist of it in the, in the beginning. And I think I'm right on time for, for lunch in case we want to do any more questions before we're done. Yeah. So this syntax, you know, with brackets, uh, might be nice for direct usage, but it's not, you know, it, it can be made programmed. So like, if I have my dimensions and I know, like, if I know my dimensions from a, say, study integer sequence, or it doesn't matter, um, 
it's, it's going to be really hard to, to, to declare an array, you know. With to generate? Oh, I, as an experiment, I actually did that. So it's just, it's if you take uh, like the dimension and be able to do isomorphic mapping between this syntax and, the, and the, like the dimension syntax, it's a, it's a straightforward meta function. Really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It can be done. I'm sure it can be done, <laughs> yeah. but I, it's, it's, it's a very straightforward meta function. It's, it's, it's recursive, right? Yeah, you just pull out and you just yank out each one of the arrays and just get the size out and then you can put it into a oh, that, that was my point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There, is, there is a ton of meta programming. Yeah. But I mean, I guess yeah. this is just, you know, a quarter piece of Yeah. It's, the reference implementation is like 95% meta programming, 5%. So the imp for performance on this, the, the implementations, the, what we, one of the motivations and I, as I brought up at the very beginning an hour and a half ago is that if we can get this kind of array ref into the standard, the, it is so inc incredibly important that the compiler can optimize through these interfaces. For the Cocos implementation, we have had to do a lot of, if I'm this compiler, put, you know, put this directive, if I'm this compiler, put that directive, and, all, and overlaying all of our, the implementation for the indexing operators to make sure that it will full, that it will truly inline, will truly collapse these things out and basically eliminate the, uh, the overhead. So I had a couple of questions and I lost track of who was first. Has CWG seen the language extension part yet? I think it's. I think it's. It's. It's gone. I think it's gone through once. Or, or, or so the. Yeah. The, I took the language extent. I, unfortunately, I made the mistake of putting the cart before the horse. Uh -huh. I took the language extension before showing the library. We should have had the library go in first, and then show them just how ugly it can get without the language extension, or the relaxation. Your users, you know, your guys that are writing code for this, are they are they using like prepackaged kernels, like ones that are in a, like in a standard in a you know, standardized place, or are they writing their own custom kernels? Oh, they're writing their own. Okay, just let everyone know we're, we're over, I just got the message we're over time, so if you want to start bailing out to lunch, that's fine. I'll answer the question about the, the um, do our users, are they using standard kernels, are they writing their own kernels? They are writing their own kernels. They're writing their, their finite, uh, finite element application kernels with basis function evaluations. They're writing material models with where they're embedded as the last dimension, where the prop parameters are last dimension of the array. And so they're, they're constantly writing new kernels which are doing indexing into these arrays. There's, yeah, you're, I mean, there are, some, there are some problems where you can use like the standard package of kernels, but for, for a lot of multi-physics codes, you end up wanting to write a, a bunch of your kernels by hand. So is this, I'm just wondering, I haven't really thought about this, but I was just wondering, is that like two different sets of users? I mean, would you, if you, if you, if you were doing it in a way that they were you know, writing, they were just using kind of a standard collection of kernels, would you interface? So if there's a standard collection of kernels, that's kind of a domain-specific library, right. and people do write those right. and, and use those, but if it, going across domains, sure. there's not a whole lot of commonality and people are filling in new domain-specific modules for their domain-specific libraries, okay. then there's another set of users that use the domain-specific stuff. So yes, you're, you're discussing users one level up in the food chain. I've, I've had to specialize LAPAC functions because the, the general purpose LAPAC implementation has not been suitably performant for the specific pattern that we're using. Right. Well, and that gets back to the, you know, like, you know, the upper and lower, like banded matrices and things like that. You have you know, yeah. you know, specialized data structures for that. I guess that kind of pl plays into this. Like some of these things maybe. So the conjecture is then then those special those domain specific libraries then have domain specific layouts yeah. that they've that they've extended with but then so i i just like get the thing that you're trying to make it so that the users don't need to know about the layout but then they run their own kernels and so and they they use the specifics about the layout to write their kernels the but idea is that they can specify the layout in one place and that that they don't that they can be indexing everywhere else in the code and the you know thousands of places where it's being used is going to stay the same and that they can they can specify the layout just once and also do you think like like I may I might want to have you know 
the, the, the indexing and the, like the order of, of my uh, indices, I might want to have them be, you know, X, Y, Z because I'm simulating, you know, some like like a, the Earth and like like it has like the coordinates have a certain meaning, but I want a different layout where it's like at a different order and having the two separated can be very powerful be because then I can make those changes without having it effect have any effect on what's written in the actual code. But doesn't that doesn't that affect performance? Though? I mean, okay. can you write? A kernel you know, that's, uh, I think it might be time. Oblivious, oblivious to the I think it might be time for us to carry this conversation to lunch. Yeah. The the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.